All right. Grab my coffee and away we go. All right. Welcome. Good morning. Here we are. Uh, last week we um, ended, uh, at least according to my notes and, and uh, markings in my scripture, at chapter 5 of Exodus. I'm assuming that's pretty much um, where, where we'll start today. Bricks without straw. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray and get into it. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together this morning as we go into your word. May you open our hearts and minds and prepare us to have our hearts and minds open so that whatever you may be asking of us, we would have obedient, willing, courageous hearts to follow through. And as we go into your word, may your word transform how we think and what we think, what we do and how we do it, and give glory to who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's take a look again at chapter 5 of Exodus. <clears throat> after Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, or afterward rather, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Now this is extremely important, that phrase. The word Lord should all be capitalized. And that is the way that in our English translations of scripture, we refer to the proper name of God, which God gave to Moses, I am Yahweh, Jehovah, etc., but it is his name. Until that time, no one knew the name of the Lord. They knew the world was ensconced, if you will, in the darkness that comes from being under other spiritual entities that are not the creator, that are not the one true as Jesus as the true God. So he refers, <clears throat> goes to Pharaoh and says, this is what the Lord Jehovah, the Elohim, the spiritual being, if you will, God, of Israel says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? Which is a proper response, not proper response, but an understandable response, given the fact that nobody knows who he is. It's very important to understand the dynamics because given the culture in which we live in, it's easy to assume that everybody knows Christianity because after all, we have a history, European history, and so it's easy to think that, like us, that, well, not so much anymore, but um, at least a number of years ago, that Christianity was spreading and, and, and most people knew of it. In this case, nobody knows who the actual creator of the world is. No one. So Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? I know Ra, I know, all the, I know the pantheon, the Egyptian pantheon, that has given us this wonderful culture powerful culture, most dominant culture on the planet, but I don't know the Lord. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I should obey him. I don't obey him. I obey these gods and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Now this is not knowing in terms of how we understand coming to, to knowledge. We understand knowledge is being able to reiterate, if you will, facts, figures, concepts, abstract thinking, etc. That's why there was essays. Remember essays? You could have multiple choice. I got a one and I got a 25% chance of getting this thing right. Unless you go to E, A, B, C, D. Yeah. If you go to E, I got a 20% chance of getting it right. But if you go to essay, 
I've got to learn my skills. Knowledge biblically is experience, which is why in some translations, not so much anymore, um, but in your King James translation, when Eve and Ad, Adam and Eve come together um, and are intimate and, and give birth to a child, it says, and Adam knew Eve. You don't have that anymore. I don't know what your translation says. Mine says, uh, <clears throat> let's see what mine says. This is the an old version of the NIV. Oh, Adam lay with his wife. That's pretty common. Newer trans, uh, translations I've read, Adam made love to his wife. It's the Motown version. But it's knowledge. It's to know. So he doesn't, it's not just conceptual, it's experiential. It's, I don't know this God. Then they said, the God, Elohim, of the Hebrews, which is a derogatory term, as I said, has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. It's a very interesting thing that, that God would, in other words, God would not strike them with plagues or the sword if they were inhibited from it being able to go, but if they were in disobedience, that's another, that's another issue. So it's not that if, if Egypt inhibits Israel from going, God will strike them, but it's an, it's an understanding of obedience, which is why... Um, Pharaoh said in verse 2, why should I obey him? So verse 4, but the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. <clears throat> Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and the foreman went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. The Israelite foremen appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers were beaten and were asked, Why didn't you meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite foreman went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw that you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite foremen realized they were in trouble when they were told you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have, not, and have put a sword rather in their hand to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. 
God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they lived as aliens. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you. There's that word redeem, which is, has everything to do with belonging. Redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. Then the Lord said to Moses, go, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Since I speak with faltering lips. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. These were the heads of their families. And you're going to get a whole list. And you're going to see lists like this. Why? Now let's get into this for a second. You probably heard... The, prom- the term, the promised land that God gave uh, Israel, the promised land. And then when you start reading the actual conquest of it, I'll lose people in the Bible study. I'm not going to worship a God that slaughters X, Y, and Z. I want the nice God. And I understand that because it's like, it's horrific. So it's important to understand what's actually happening. God just didn't, you know, here's a good idea. I'll promise to give you this land and so forth. If you don't understand the background story behind it, 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 it throws, it can throw one into confusion. God creates a family. Bear in mind, you have I know it's, it's odd in, in our, our culture today because we focus so much, almost entirely, on the physical. The, all of our schooling from early on is exclusively focused on the physical. You might get some teaching on character, but outside of elementary school, that goes out the window. You might get some, you know, be patient, that kind of thing. Um, you can see it like in, well, do you see some of that stuff in, in your, what do you see, what character development? I saw it in the film, but it's time. Okay, that's, that's nice, you know. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. It used to be um, the golden rule. Remember that? And the golden rule is what? Remember? Yeah, treat others as you would. Yeah, and it's it's it comes from the biblical understanding. Chuck Berry talked about that in his. Uh, that'd be good. Um, but we don't have that anymore. So any character is just generalization kind of a thing. All of the schooling is focused on the physical. Nothing is in, is 
re, re, is pertains to the spiritual. So it's very foreign. Biblically, and this is where you get spiritual knowledge. When people generally, because of their training, go to this and are primarily looking for physical, it is very easy to completely overlook the spiritual. You just kind of overlook it. So the Egyptian gods, for example, we would consider as being, oh, mythical characters that don't have much, much say. When in reality, scripturally, they are beings that are enslaving humanity. They are rebellious beings, spiritual. There was a rebellion in the, in the spiritual realm before the physical realm. And this is very, for the Israelites, they understand this, especially the Jews of Jesus' time. This is, this is not foreign to them. It's foreign to us, not foreign to them. And so God, in creating a spiritual family that you see, referred to in Job, the sons of God, not just in Job, but in other scriptures as well, in creating the earth, creates and desires to co-create with his earthly family. He doesn't call us and let us create human beings in our image. He doesn't call us anything other than family. Sons. You get Old Testament, big on family. So sons, daughters, his children, it goes through the entire scriptures. You will, it's, it's, it, it permeates the entire scriptures. What does it mean to be God's son? What does it mean to be his daughter? What does it mean? And generally speaking, arguably, if you ask Christians, it means you get to go to heaven, which is true. But that's just a, a part of the bigger truth. We will be glorified like Jesus, given a glorified body, to reign with him throughout eternity in the new created world and to be his family. This is a theme throughout all of Scripture. Pharaoh is the Egyptian God's family. Sometimes it's referred to as a dynasty. But either or, Pharaoh is, cons nobody elected Pharaoh. Where does Pharaoh get his power? From his gods. Which is why he just doesn't choose someone to marry. They set up, they determine who he's going to marry. Which is why there's a lot of incestual activity in this kind of scenario. God's desire from day one, his intention, which has not changed, is to have a created world in which he has a human family that reigns with him. Rebellion comes into this world from a spiritual realm. That's Genesis 3. It's not... Nobody gave Eve that thought. I mean, I'm sorry. Eve did not come up with that thought on her own. That's very clear in Scripture. Eve didn't say, do, do, do. Oh, wow, look at that. You know, I was thinking the other day. No. Most of what you think, most of what I think, is not what we chose to think, but was passed on to us. Now, the Holy Spirit speaks and gives us truth. 
But outside of God, we don't get truth. Outside of God, we are subject to voices that do not have truth. So, in Genesis 3, the spiritual, non-physical being called the serpent. Now, you can just say, you know what, this is just, let's just stick with, with Christianity being feeding the poor. Which is, it's too hard. You get into this stuff, you, you better be careful. Because now you're responsible for what you know. When Jesus says, I'll tell you the truth. Maybe he wasn't telling the truth, but I, I'm going to take him at his word. Anyone, not just a few, anyone who has faith in me will be a member of a church. Oh, membership, it's so exciting. Let's get the books out. No. Anyone who has faith in me, anyone, will do what I have been doing. In fact, they will do even greater things than these. Well, what was he doing? <sighs> Casting out demons, healing the sick, proclaiming the kingdom of God, making disciples. When was the last time we had a deliverance ministry that you know of any church? Because we don't do it. It's been, a, it's been a forgotten reality of the gospel message. And because of that, when you look back at when we start reading Exodus, it feels very foreign. We know how to do a lot of great church things. My mom can make a banner in two days flat. Just give her a pattern. And we talk about things in, you know, but in terms of when Jesus says, you'll do what I've been doing, I think it can be scary. And, and you should have a, a holy and healthy fear of it. You don't go messing with stuff like that. So when, number one, rebellion enters into the human realm, whether it's ideas or now an impressed nature that we nurture, We cannot be in that state and still be able to reign with God. So he doesn't allow us to eat of the tree of life and be in that condition, that state forever. That's the first rebellion. Then you get this weird thing in, in Genesis 6 with these sons of God. and, and let's, let's, not, let's not talk about that. It's, it's, but it's there. And Peter refers to it. And Jude refers to it. But you're going to be hard-pressed to find any Lutheran publication that deals with it. We'll talk about, oh, God, when my mom was doing, my mom used to go to different women's groups. This was, this, was this was an important one. Let's do a cookbook. Nothing wrong with a cookbook, unless you don't like Scandinavian food. I mean, some of those cookbooks are great. I knew how to make a lot of different kinds of jello. And, and I don't know about you, but we had on our wall three different copper, you know what I'm talking about? Molds. Molds. The, not the toxic molds. And we, we were, I mean, it was, it was such a big thing. We put it on the wall. And we'd take it down and we'd, ooh, I have an idea. Let's, 
let's take some carrots and shred them a little bit. We'll put that in the pineapple. No, see, you're uppity. We we're <laughs> you're an uppity church person. We didn't have pineapple. You didn't, I don't know where you get your money. We took a carrot. Just wash it off, and there you go. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's wonderful. But making jello for a, a, a church function ain't the same as going into prayer, intentionally going into prayer to go into battle. I'll do a prayer group. You know how many Lutherans are going to show up? Not very many. It's just not part of our tradition. Even though that's the requirement. No, no, no. Print it out. I'll read the prayer on Sunday. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not going to suffice with regards to this. So then you get the Nephilim, which are the sons of God, trying to create their own family. And it's referred to as the Nephilim. And the Nephilim then go and settle into these various areas of Canaan, of which God says, I'm going to give you their land. But they're not my family. Another word for that in Hebrew is Raphim, which means giant. David had to battle a giant. And then you get the Tower of Babel, in which God says, I'm just taking their language just and turning them over. Since they don't want me to be their God, I'll give, turn them over to lesser Elohim. And that's where you have it. So in Pentecost, that all changes. And God is moving forward to reclaim what is rightfully his, land. So as soon as the Tower of Babel ends, end of that chapter, dis disinheriting these nations that don't want anything to do with me, I'll choose him, Abraham, and he will be my family, since that's my intention. And I will, through him, build my family first and bring them into this land and dispossess the various peoples that are currently in the land that are not even human. This is what's happening. Not just a nice little story that Steven Spielberg can put on a, make some money. I mean, it's good to do that. But it's far bigger, a far bigger picture. So, at first, the very first step is God announcing what he wants to have happen. It's, it's an announcement. Are you going to obey it? And not only are the the demonic, the gods, and the human family that are created to, connected to that gods, not only are they ensconced, but they are going to squelch any kind of rebellion that they may perceive. That's the first thing. When people get really on fire for God, new Christians, I'm like, ho, 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 be careful. Because you don't know what you're doing. And if you can get with somebody that does know what they're doing, they will be able. You just don't send a bunch of 18-year-olds into battle without anybody that's not seasonally trained in, in, in battle. You have to have people that can have the experience and the character and the knowledge, experiential knowledge, so that when all hell breaks loose, they don't freak out. There is a reason why Jesus says to Peter, you're not able to follow me now. I know you want to, but you don't have the character to withstand the fear yet. Later, you will. I don't have any fear. I'm ready to... Yeah, I'm all gung-ho. You're gung-ho now. I get it. But before the morning alarm goes off, you're going to deny me. And you're going to do it three times just to make sure that it wasn't a fluke. 
Don't worry about it. When you come back to your brothers, strengthen them. This is all part of the process. So this is what's taking place. The resistance, the screws, are being brought to, uh, brought to bear on this situation. So you get this family lineage. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in verse 13, and Aaron about the Israelites, and Pharaoh king of Egypt. And he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. These were the heads of their families, the sons of Reuben. And then he goes into the sons of Reuben, sons of Simeon. These were the names of the sons of Levi in verse 16. That's, that bears um, special attention because they will become those who work at the tabernacle. The sons of um, Amram in verse 20, it follows Kohath because of a special um, anointing they will have and a special task. Um, then you go, these are the heads of the Levite families, clan by clan. It was this same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. It was the same Moses and Aaron. And he goes back and forth. Most of the time, the focus has been on Moses leading them out. But Moses and Aaron are inseparable in this endeavor. Aaron does all the talking. So, Verse 28, now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Very important because he's not, he's no longer in Midian. He is in enemy territory. I am, now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Always an excuse. Chapter 7, then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. So this is, Moses is now in Egypt. He is well aware of the Egyptian gods, the potential that the Egyptian gods have in exerting power over the land, supernatural power, and God has sent them in to, we call it this. Paul will use this word. A strong hold. And God is sending Moses into this place to tear down this stronghold. And says to, in this chapter, to Moses. I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. He gives Moses authority over the gods of Egypt to speak in, and this is very important because we're going to, we'll move forward into this other uh, dynamic of talking about God's name, but for right now, Moses is given authority to tear down an Egyptian stronghold. It is the most powerful civilization on the planet. It is the most powerful and it is the most destructive and demonic. And, in, and the way in which, this is important, the way in which the stronghold is dismantled is 
by A, listening to God, B, being obedient to God, and C, speaking God's word into the situation. And since Moses keeps on saying he doesn't have that kind of skill of oratorial skills, Aaron will speak into it, which is fine. Okay, Aaron will do it. Aaron will be the prophet that will speak. But those are the ways in which strongholds are tore down. If one is unaware that there's even a stronghold in place, you won't tear it down. What you will do is develop some kind of social program. And deal with it strictly in a physical manner or physical approach. And the stronghold will still be there. So, this is what's taking place in chapter 7. You are to say, this is verse 2, you are to say everything I command you and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. I will. And though I multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions. You have anything other than divisions? My people? Anything before my people? I have my people too, but anyone? Is it just my people? Ah, you have army? You have what? Hosts? It's a military term. Divisions, hosts, army. You ever think of a church? We used to think of a church like that. Onward Christian soldiers. No, oh, that's too, no, oh, that's not nice. Man, if you don't understand what that is, it can, it can morph into something that it should not be in any way. But it's not a mob. We're going to war, spiritual war. Almost every single letter of Paul refers to this. For we wage war not against this war, not the way the world does. Ephesians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. For we battle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Many times the church just puts the period right after, for we battle not. Period. Way too focused on on whatever it is that we're focused on. Pick up a Lutheran, pick up a Lutheran magazine and see if you can find anything about spiritual warfare in there. Good stuff. Sometimes feeding the poor. Sometimes, you know, clothing, etc. Relief. That's good. Not a thing about spiritual warfare. If you don't understand, this is the dynamic that's in play from the very beginning of the announcement of the Christ. Oh, Herod heard that someone's going to be Messiah. He's going to try to kill you. Oh, that's not a nice story. Let's not read that. Let's put the little kids in with wings, you know, little shepherds, and that's cute. But talk about the spiritual warfare. <laughs> I've yet to have a, a play, Christmas play, that depicts what actually happened to the two-year-old boys that, that were there. They got slaughtered. But that's ugly, and it's uncomfortable, and that's not what we're about. We're about being comfortable in terms of human nature. So this is very important. He is bringing out his divisions. It is his people. 
And they are not going to war against other people. They are going to war against spiritual entities. It's so important. If you don't understand that, you can have a community that is very oppressed, drug-inflicted. You've got domestic violence. You've got uh, sexual assaults. You've got all this stuff. And you can have a food program, which is helpful. And yet, the same spiritual forces that are oppressing the people are still there. And wonder why there's not anything happening. Have you had programs time and time again where you feed the poor and you feed the poor and not one person comes to Christ? What's going on? Well, that's not really what. We don't want to preach. We don't want to be preachy. So don't use the words Jesus. And now if you're going to be in, in line with the government, you're not allowed to. So very important to understand what's taking place in the unseen realm as well as the seen realm. He's taking turf, my people. He goes on. And the Egyptians, this is verse 5, will know that I am the Lord. They will know when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. It's a long time. It's 40 years being in Midian. So we go on. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. That's the first one, and it gives you, it gives you a revelation that the Magic arts have a certain degree of power. If you want to understand that dynamic a little bit more fully with someone who's experienced it, talk to Jim Stone. Jim Stone has been involved in the black occult, was a drug addict on the patio outside my office until Jesus saved him in a mighty act. Now, guess what? He doesn't walk around making a big thing out of it. But on Sunday morning, you will find him and I praying. And he prays as a warrior prays because he understands. And if you look at him, most timid guy in the world. Yes. Involved in the occult. Addicted. Homeless on my patio and is serving the living God. If we weren't Lutheran, I'd say, can I hear an amen? But if it's not printed in the bulletin, I might not get one. It's called victory. It's a very serious thing we're involved in. The Lord then said to Moses, or, or I'm sorry, we got, we got, Verse 14. That's the first one. And it's important to understand the snake as a serpent was a deity in Egypt. That's why you will find serpents in, in their garb. And they're terrifying. It was a very important first step in training Moses to overcome the fear and to listen to the obedience, or not to listen, but to listen to God and then to obey God over and above this fear so that God could demonstrate his power. Remember when he did it with Moses and the staff. Throw the staff down. Yes. 
What did God say then after he threw it down? By the what? By the tail. Nobody picks up a snake by a tail. Yeah, nobody picks up a snake by a tail. Do it. Do it. And it became a snap. Okay, whew. I got experience. I don't have that fear to deal, to deal with when I go into Egypt. It is a continuous lesson of overcoming the fears that would inhibit you from walking in the power of God. Continuous. And that's important to understand because people that are afraid at one level will gather together to enforce their fear and impose that fear on everybody else. And I've seen that happen in church. We're going forward in God. And there's, di there's a difference between discernment and fear, right? But if you, can if you can discern that difference, then you can spot it. Some people just go around and say, you know, I'm, remember we're, we're going to have some function. You know, it's a potluck kind of a thing. We're very good at that. Better would, when we were pre-fast food. Pre-fast food potlucks were so much better. Um, you know, you, you, you're, you're always going to find a tater tot hot dish somewhere, uh, you know, pre-fast food. But anyway, and someone came up to me, oh, I'm just very concerned. I mean, um, if, if the county comes in and if somebody gets sick and, and, and they, and, um, and, and we haven't, um, had the proper, whatever, you know, counties do then th th they could shut it down. I know it because I belong to different organizations and that's what they're concerned. And, you know, they got all these regulations. You weren't concerned. You are possessed by a spirit of fear. And wherever you go, it suppresses the joy of everybody involved. Everybody. She's right. Oh, uh, maybe we shouldn't have it. Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> and it just, it spreads like a virus. And you're going to see this happen. Once they get out of Egypt, we went up, and you're right, God, oh, man, it looks wonderful, but we can't take it because there's Nephilim there. Nephilim? Yeah, the Nephilim are there. And they're giants. We, it's just, I, and and, it's, and we'll get to it. And they spread a bad report. Just an idea. Let it run. So this is the spiritual war. It's, it's the same thing in Genesis 3. It's just an idea. Let it run. Be, God will reveal continuously those ideas that you have entertained, that you have grown into a full adult plant, that you pick the fruit of the plant and have it on a regular basis and have no idea that the tree is a tree you never should have even had in your garden in the first place. But it looked good, and was pleasing to the eye, and at the time, you couldn't discern it. Most of those trees, most of those plants, come into our lives when we're children and don't have the wherewithal to know the difference. It's not a mistake that Jesus says the word of God is like seeds. And if, you're, if you become aware of meditating on the word of God, you will become aware, more aware, of all the seeds that you entertain that rile you up so that you're ready to go off. And that's exactly what their intention is to do, to get you to that state. And you come in to meditate. Give you an example. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. He had to do that. What do we do? Oh, crap. 911. 
and that's intentional from the enemy. You think God is running the TV shows? You think God runs NBC? ABC? Any of them? The word of God and only the word of God gives us refreshment and can calm our soul. Jesus says it this way. Peace I leave with you. My peace. Not what they say will give you peace. My peace I give you. I do not give the way the world gives. It's very profound and very powerful. Christians, generally speaking, should be the ones that are able to teach people how to have peace in the midst of the storm. But when we can't do it, how can we teach others? If I can't do it, Kyle said the other day, I'm so glad God revealed to you your 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 nurturing of pride because you're just a different person. And for the last two weeks, you just kept getting increasingly irritated and short. I said, I know, I'm, I'm thankful too, and I apologize. But you knew what you signed up for when we got married. I didn't say that. All right, we're on the blood, plague of blood, chapter 7. Is this making sense? I hope so. You can't necessarily understand these things until you've lived on the planet for a while and seen what's taking place and then go, oh, that's what's taking place. Okay. Chapter 7, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the water. Wait on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take your in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. But until now, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this, you will know that I am the Lord with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds, and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the wooden buckets and stone jars. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile. And all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water of the river. So this is the second time now that God is demonstrating. And so are the secret arts demonstrating their power. This is a cosmic battle. And I think I'm just going to leave it at that because we'll get to the frogs the next time. Hmm. Any questions? Whatever, thank you, God. Whatever God is doing, may He be praised. Um, cool. Well, if there's no questions, um, thank you, Corey, for taking care of the recording. I thanked last Sunday um, Adrian 
for being flexible with putting the music up there. And, you know, hey, thank you, Adrian. Someone said, he's a hero. I'm like, okay, that's too much. Not a hero. He didn't go into a burning, you know, burning building and rescue. But anyway, he is a hero. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. May it be that you are revealing your truth to us for such a time as this. May it be that whatever is happening in this community, in this city, in this block, in this world, you are calling us to the same degree that you called Moses. And may it also be that we don't want to do it the way he didn't want to do it. Whatever the case may be, may you teach us and show us your will. Give us hearts that are obedient and courageous. And in so doing, may all that we do and say glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great rest of the day.